Imagine you're the parent of a five-year-old. Your five-year-old has been watching the circus ads on television, hearing it in the media, and begging you, mom, take me to the circus. You wonder, is five too young to go to the circus? But you brush away your doubts and you buy the tickets. When the big day arrives, you go all out. You say yes to cotton candy and helium balloons, overpriced frankfurter and soda pop. On the way home in the car, your child is quiet for a while. And then suddenly, that circus was dumb. Dumb? What do you mean it was dumb? Well, it, it, there wasn't enough stuff in it. There was all kinds of things in the circus. We saw them training the tigers. Well, those exactly. tigers were smelly, too. Ugh. Well, of course animals smell. But they're... they'd be by, ugh. I don't like to be around the you smelly You begged stuff. me to go to a circus, and I spent all that money and took all that time to take you. I let you have cotton candy, and I let you have soda. Well, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. That's all we did today was because you wanted to go. Well, it, it just, it just, I don't know, it wasn't fun to do, and I didn't want to be there, and I was too many people. There's a lot of people. I was never, you begged so, me to go. You sure I, seemed like you were having fun when you said, Mommy, Mommy, please, can I have this? Can I have that? I don't think I really said I begged you. I just I, I had a little interest in it, but I, that was just. I just knew I shouldn't have taken you. You're just too young to understand these things, and uh, there's just no pleasing you. I'm not taking you to the circus again. Take the cat. <laughs> what were your feelings during this conversation? Did you imagine yourself being the parent or the child? Maybe you had a similar situation with a child of any age about any activity <laughs> or similar experience. And how did the conversation play out? Well, Hello, this is Don. And this is Gina. With Focused Healthy Family. And this is podcast number 88. And today we're, we're talking about feelings. We're kind of going through some stuff that comes from the book. How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. And, you know, we talked about books on the last podcast, and we just wanted to kind of delve into this one a little bit more. We're giving you an example of what we play out, the workbook that comes with being a part of the workshop that we do based on this book. And the big first chapter and essential part of it is acknowledging feelings. Yeah, and in that, that scenario, as, as the child, I, I was scared. Everything about it was a little overwhelming. Uh, the, you know, my, it probably played on my senses, you know, got too overloaded in, in my senses with all the things going on. And the animals, you know, kind of scared me. But as a kid, I, I wanted to, you know, well, with other, other kids, I wanted to act cool. So I, I wanted to act like this was fine. But I bottled that scaredness up in me. And I it. I just want to blurt out some something to cover up how scared I was. Well, and you said um, mm -hmm. a lot of times kids maybe can't get to what their feeling is. And they make a statement like that. And we don't take the time to understand what's going on behind it. You know, it's easy to react in the moment. You're tired. It's been a busy day. Maybe it wasn't that fun for you. Or you wanted your kid to have fun so much that you're really upset that they didn't. You take it personally, you know, as a parent. And then you want it. A lot of times you want to fix it, solve it. Or you want to, you know, justify your position that, that it's take you've taken it personally. Well, and, you know, it's like we're trying to convince your, the child you really did have fun. And so what happens when we do that, when we don't pay attention, <laughs> when the cat's right in front of our face and it's telling us something. So when we don't pay attention, so when the child, you know, said that was dumb, how could we have responded differently to that? And how does that conversation play out differently when you can take a few minutes you know, we tend to react oftentimes rather than respond. And that's something that we talk about with this book and this workshop. And we delve into that with, 
because we always talk about because in this particular case that's a behavior that 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 child's doing is that that blurting out and we talk about the fact that behavior is a form of communication it's what's underlying the behavior is what you have to really look into and these mm -hmm. feelings that they're dealing with are, are the underlying thing uh the uh, the fact that she was scared but didn't know how to really express that right uh, or how, and I shouldn't say right that's not a good way but didn't know how to really get it out well how to express what they were actually feeling yes. and you know any of us if we're upset it's harder to get words out it's hard to put things to explain things and for a child yeah they might have a sophisticated language maybe even a five-year-old yet when they're upset when they're feeling all emotional anxious it can be harder to put that into words and it just comes out as dumb stupid bad those, those deeper emotions and what's really going on and they might be afraid to really share what they're really or feeling. feeling or feel embarrassed that oh you know what well, they kind of can tend to uh, should on themselves. I, I, sh I should, I should be able to deal with this. Even at five, I think they can kind of have that thought of, you know, I, I really shouldn't be this way. I, you know, mom and dad have told me not to be this way, or they've shown me not to be this way, and it's embarrassing to to feel it and then not feel like you can get it out. Right, and it, you know, kind of depends on what the dynamic has been all along with your child and how you communicate. And it's in these these simpler, less stressful situations compared to bigger stressors in life, bigger challenges. And as our kids get older, the challenges can get a whole lot more difficult. There can be a whole lot more at stake, safety issues. And taking the time when our kids are young to learn these skills, makes a big difference in how they communicate with us in well, the future. Yeah, and, and, and in a way, though, too, I want to make sure that it isn't just about little kids, though, you know, that this is never too late to to improve your improve communication, your communication because yeah, I was I was just as we were talking, we, we didn't really talk about this. But, you know, what about a scenario of, of a teen when, when, you know, we don't listen to a teen? I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, uh, situations that well you probably remember from your teen years uh, times when um your mom and dad didn't really listen or and you didn't weren't able to express uh, i run into it a lot with my patients they even the uh, the adults i find when we dig into it they can look back at a certain point in their time in their life when the parent really ignored a, a situation that was very was really uh, profound to them, and it made a profound effect on them because they didn't they didn't get their parents to really listen. They didn't feel heard, and so they have that lingering issue with feeling invisible, feeling well, like no one's paying attention to me, no one's listening, and so they might either make themselves louder or quieter. Well, yeah, because I well. One of the things in, in the tapping work I do, a lot of times I'll tap on the whole idea of I lost my voice when I was very young because the people that, <laughs> the people that, that um, a, lot, a lot of times the people that can't get up in front of a crowd and, and speak in front of a crowd. <laughs> lost my voice when I was very young. <laughs> well, and I think we all, uh, it, it's a very common thing to happen is because of this, what we went through in that scenario was kind of the beginning stages of of that kind of development, where just over and over again, you you don't get a lot, you know, you're really not allowed to express what you're really feeling, and then you become afraid to express what you're feeling after a while, and so you go into life with that, and and then what I've seen too is these people go through their life and bring people and, and, and the situations to them that keep building on that same thing. To kind of like replay out the scenario. Yeah. They find a partner who's similar to the parent and okay. they're re-experiencing that scenario and hoping it would be different. Yet kind of talking about, you know, baggage that we carry around and issues that we have in relationships. And a lot of it boils down to communication. And at any point in our life, whether we're five or 95, 
or 105, <laughs> people are living longer. We can choose differently. We can, and acknowledging feelings, it doesn't even mean you have to accept what they're feeling, but just recognizing and acknowledging that they're having this feeling. Mm -hmm. Allowing them to get it out or, or speak it out or vent it out. There's not a complex formula to doing that. No. And yet we all, most people tend to jump in with answers. We don't like to see people upset. We want to fix it. We want someone to feel good, especially with our children. We want them to be happy and success, successful in this world and to enjoy experiences and yet we're doing them a disservice when we don't allow them to have disappointment, frustration, sadness, fear, anger, all these feelings that we often label as negative. We need to allow them to have those feelings and give them appropriate outlets to express it. Well, um, you get into a place where, um, they, like I say, their, their voice in the future isn't there. They're, they're not able to get out of it. So it affects their affects them for forever, really. It, and it, it, it kind of goes to this feeling that one of the passions I have is that we we are able to get this information to somebody at very early stages in the family so that it, you know they can build a, a better relationship with their kids. And it's the kind of skill when we the workshops are geared for parents and focusing on that parent-child relationship. And yet as we practice it, we're practicing the skills with other adults. It can be so helpful for two partners raising kids to practice it with each other. It can be, we've had grandparents on, you know, we've had a grandmother and a mom and- the Mom and the grandmother. And the grandmother who both, and the grandmother had a lot um, to do with raising the child. So they were on it together. And so their relationship played out with things and we're all learning the skills of communicating and listening better because it's not only with children that we need to do this. Yeah. It's with everyone we encounter anywhere we go, um, whether we're buying something in a store and maybe you're trying to get help and the person's ha having a bad day, but all you see is that they're being rude or mean or whatever's going on with them. And you don't know what's going on in the background right behind closed doors or you know however you want to think about it think but. about one of your bad days and oh my gosh i can't believe i acted like that in that store i can't believe i said that to that salesperson or you know and what was going on behind it well you know if, if it's okay thinking about how with your dad what you've been able to do to get your dad to calm down when he's had situations you just listen to him so my dad has dementia uh, he has Parkinson's type dementia. There are lots of different types of dementia, and we'll delve into that more. Did you mention that? <laughs> Sorry, that was that. And um, he has delusions where he thinks something's happened. He thinks someone's taken his money. He thinks there's common themes with all types of dementia. The spouse is cheating on them. The spouse is leaving them, taking the money. These things are, are kind of very common when someone's dealing with those types of things. And when he's wrapped in that delusion, that false thought, it just that's what feels real to him. And so there's a point where you can't really say. Can't fight it. Can't, can't like, you know, dad, that's not happening right now. But sometimes what I've been able to do to help him calm down is say, wow, OK, you're, you're really scared right now. What can we do right now? You know, sometimes he's, he tends to get into flight and he just wants to literally run out the door. And he has run out the door down the street, um, gone to the neighbors is, you know, let's, can you sit down Maybe put your feet up? Let's get something to drink. Let's just, let, let's just, you know, sit for a minute. Let me just hear you. Let's take a breath and we can come, we'll come up with a solution for this. And for my dad, that just being heard, that just not trying to solve it, change it, fix it. Or, and sometimes the reassurance, letting him know, okay, we're going to take care of it. Um, can help calm him down to kind of get him out of that heightened mm -hmm. place. And, you know, with kids, they often really just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And we miss that so many times when we, you know, do this workshop, when we work with families, you know, the biggest skill is just shutting up, <laughs> <laughs> tuning in to your child, stopping what you're doing, putting the phone down, turning your head, not to stare at them intently, 
but to acknowledge, to be looking at them and really making that effort to stop what you're doing. Because if you can take five minutes, sometimes it doesn't even take that to right. set down what you're doing and say, oh, wow, you're really upset. You know, you want to tell me more about that? You let them talk and they disappear versus getting in a battle with them. Mom, you're not really listening. They start tugging on your sleeve. You get annoyed. Why are you always doing that? I'm trying to get things done. And you get in this battle. They huff off. And what have you done with your relationship? Yeah. And sometimes it can be, it really can be a shorter experience, the listening. Although if we're not used to doing that, it can take a lot more effort. Reacting, if it's a pattern of what we've done, how we've ever heard other people talk to us and react, it's, it's automatic. It doesn't feel like work. Whereas changing how we say things, changing how we respond mm -hmm. to things, it makes takes an extra effort. And that's what's so great about this workshop is we learn the skills together. There's little exercises where we just follow the script of cartoons. And then we literally practice playing the part of the child, playing the part of the parent. It helps to practice it and to put yourself in the shoes of a kid, remembering what it was like when you were a kid, mm -hmm. how you might've felt. And so you get to practice those skills because in order to get, better at using them and in order to incorporate it yeah. into day to day life. You know, one thing when we're first learning this, um, we can sound kind of prescribed as we're talking. Um, our daughter says to me, don't be a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what you are. An occupational I'll use therapist. This language of trying to listen and support her. She's well, yeah, she used to, she was, well, our oldest, older daughter used to always say, "Don't use that stop, stuff on me." Stop using that psychology stuff on me, or you know something like that. You know, so yeah. Well, it kind of goes to our, our our common thing we always talk about is: Do you want the fifteen minute conversation or an hour long battle? And that's what these kind of how you respond, how you communicate, makes and, that difference in that. Well, and what we're talking about is getting comfortable using it, yeah, making it. Yeah work for you making it part of your lifestyle and so even though we practice certain ways of saying things it might look differently you it and the key is really believing that it's important to listen because if we don't believe that i'm like oh, i'm just going to follow this script this book says do this say this do this say this yeah, you, don't wanna... <laughs> you might not have any success at all and a lot of books that talk about um co communication skills with children Cooperative parenting. What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Let me see if I can find it here. here. <laughs> Conscious parenting. There are a lot of books in theory, and it's a matter of understanding it, which is important. Yet it helps to have some practical things that mm -hmm. we can do. Yet you can't just practice the skill without really getting <laughs> the belief behind it. Yeah. Um, it's it's got to be authentic, right? And so when we're doing anything different, when we're changing how we do things, there's going to be some unsteadiness, some disrupting oh, yeah. of the pattern, depending on how different this language is compared to how you normally talk to your children. Well, sometimes the kids kind of, they don't know what to do when you react differently. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what what's going on? I think I can remember our kids kind of doing a little bit of that. of just, what? <laughs> you know, they're not... They weren't used to that, the way we approached them with that. And it threw them off just a little bit. But um, We've told this story before, but it's fitting. So I found this book when, gosh, our oldest was a baby. And, you know, over the years I had read it and put it aside, forgotten kind of about it. And I was really trying to delve into it again when our oldest child was, I don't know if he was six or eight. And you tell the story well. <laughs> Because you were standing off in the background, and he came charging down the stairs, mad at his Just sister. raring out. Rawr, you know, uh, what his sister had done and all this. And uh, I was standing back away where you two couldn't see me. Or, well, you, I, I, I could see you, and you, you really didn't know I was, I was observing. And, you know, if I would have been standing in front of the stairs when he came down, I probably would have said something you know, like, oh, come on, isn't that bad? You know, just go up, take care of it. What, What's the big deal? Kind of, that would have been my re 
poor and, response. And, you know, I, in similar situations, yeah, I, mean, I, you know, what are you fighting? Well, about? And, Do you need me to come up there? Yeah. Even, you know, but, well-intentioned statements. But in this particular situation, you kind of did a little bit of a step back and you go, wow, you're really upset. Uh, tell me a little bit more. And I, like I said, I always, I still can I picture my oldest turning around like, are, are you talking to me? You know, <laughs> he, he wasn't used to that. And, uh, he went well, and he went on talking more. And through that next part, all you did through the next part of that was to go, huh, really? Wow. You know, just little simple, no adding anything in, just no acknowledging. Because mm -hmm. if you just sit there and listen yeah, without, you made noise. <laughs> without saying <laughs> yeah. anything, they're like, are you still here? So yeah. it's like, you know, just, oh, wow. You know, oh, goodness, you know. Yeah. And then when he, uh, when he got to the, the end of it, he said, well, I just want to make sure anything else. And he said, no, I don't think so. And then you really blew me away because you, you looked at me and said, well, so how do you think you could resolve this? And he sat there and went, well, um, I don't know. I, I guess I could go talk to her, you know, kind of that talk, I guess, you know, kind of that kind of, and, uh, you said, well, do you, I think you actually said something like, do you, do you need me to referee, you know, or, and uh, he said, no, I, I think I got it. He turned around and went upstairs and five minutes later, the two were up there giggling and laughing and, and back to having a good time. And I can remember walking over to go, what the hell did you do? You know, <laughs> I'm like, what was that? You know, it just kind of, cause my mouse is on the floor watching this and, uh, but, and you told me, you kind of reminded me about the book. I think you had told me about it before. And, and so, and that kind of, that, that really set in me then and kind of helped get me more and more to doing that myself. And, and, the, and the key with, the key with that was I stopped what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I paid attention. I took that few minutes to and not get involved in, in this mess and this drama, right? A lot of times our kids are fighting, what's going on in here? You guys are doing this. Yeah. I was able to sort of be removed and it kind of helped because he was up the stairs a little bit. And, yeah. and I was able to say, wow, you know, you're upset. What's going on? And, you know, like you said, and it's not like I never spoke that way to him, no, but, but I wasn't, you know, the reacting and, and he shared and at the, the key was <clears throat> letting him know, is there more you want to tell me about this, you know? And then how do you think you can resolve it? So instead of solving our problems for our children, it is so important to help them facilitate their own problem solving. And what better way is to have the opportunity in these small little situations so that when they're out there with friends, when they get older and they get in a difficult situation, that they have practiced problem solving skills and are not just turning to an adult or a peer to solve a problem because when our kids are teens and they're out there with friends and driving in cars with friends, and if they're good at doing what they're told, that's how kids get into, you know, drugs and all kinds of situations because they're good they're at thinking on their own. They're good at doing know. what their friends are telling them to do rather than independently coming to decisions for themselves. I, I think one time you, I, I don't know if I'm not sure, if, but you, I think one time you said, well, I don't want to ride in like some knight on white horses and save the day for them and solve their problems for them. I want them to be able to do that. And I thought that was really good. And, and, uh, you know, it, like I said, I, I started using it on, with them, but I also used it in business. Uh, and I, I think I've told this story before, but I, I have one time uh, I was, way back I had my own uh, web design business and one of my customers called me up and it was one of those kind of calls where you just want to almost pull the phone away because they were very upset. I can't believe, you know, just kind of almost Is not their screaming. email not working? That used to be the <laughs> biggest complaint from your customers. <laughs> well, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was really, you know, and he, he just was like, ah, ah, you know, at me. And when he got quiet, I said, wow, you're really upset. I, I'd like to know more. And I just shut up. And it got really quiet on the other. I thought he hung up on me at first. And I said, are, are you still there? And he said, he said, wow, I've never had anybody respond to me like that before. <laughs> and it was so interesting because it his energy, just like our, our son's energy went down dramatically after that. And we were able then to 
I just, you know, because then I said, wow, it sounds like a lot of things have happened that I we need to talk about. Let's let's talk through this. And we did. And it, it wasn't like I folded to everything that he wanted to do. But I he he'd say, Well, you you did this and I need this done. And I, I and, and some of them I would say, Well, you know, um that one, I I don't know that I could do that. How about if we did this? And we went back and it was really it ended up being a really good conversation. And in fact, at the end, we were kind of laughing and joking and it resolved it. And the con- conversation took maybe 10, 15 minutes versus, you know, if I would have backfired lost on lost a customer. Yeah, lost customer. I would have been on the phone for listening to him just continue, you know. And, and when it, you got off the call with him, how would that have affected you? You know, and yeah. the, the rest of your interactions with people, you could have been so annoyed at him. You could take it out <laughs> and another, ruin your day or whatever, however you want to say it. You know, yeah. you and, so it, it changed a lot. And and I don't think people realize how much, you know, we, we hear it from when we're doing the workshops, you know, about two weeks into it, parents will come back to us and say, not only did it help their communication, but they noticed a behavior change and they noticed the anxiety and the stress of the house kind of had gone down some. So it, it affects so much more than we ever imagined by how we communicate and how we talk and how we, ex- like I say, we really let, allow them to express their feelings and talk. So just think about yourself if you're upset, if you had something's happened to you, you know, who you turn to usually the person who maybe listens well. It could be your partner, it could be your friend, it could be someone else, maybe your mom. Um, and what do you want from them? You know, when you're, oh, I had this bad day, and the traffic was awful, and I had difficulty, my schedule was all messed up. And oh, that, I, that sucks. I, <laughs> <laughs> I taught him to say that. <laughs> because what I want is not someone to solve this for me, someone to justify what what happened, to try to fix it. Um, I just want to be heard. I just want to be able to vent. And that's like your client, they vented to you and you gave them that space to do that. And even though it was all coming at you, you were able to be, and it's kind of a needing to step back from the situation. And so sometimes, you know, if we have a good friend, it's a little easier to be stepped back, you know, versus someone you live with. It can be <laughs> trickier with a spouse or partner or, um, but it does work. We have when we do it, and when we're it really it does it has helped us through a lot of different stuff. And so kids, they need that too. And I know sometimes you hear a kid griping about something, and you got dinner you got to make, you've got to get things ready, you got to plan for the trip you're taking, and their little squabble about a toy or whatever doesn't seem powerful to it, you. It seems so minuscule. Like you know, I'll give you something to have problems about. Right. You know, yeah, I'll give you something to talk about, cry um, about. But to them, it is that's important to them. And if we don't acknowledge what's important to them, whether they're four, whether they're 10 or 15, and, you know, even a teen, what is important to them still looks different from us. Mm-hmm. Even though they're talking and looking like adults, they're not fully. They're, they're not a 30, 40-year-old parent who's raised children. They're still growing and developing as we've said many times before, the brain continues to grow and develop. And with more research over the years, they said the 20s, now they're saying even to the late 20s that we're still developing those cognitive skills at a higher level of thinking and problem solving. And think about, you know, even a teen, their prior experience that they have to pull from is much more shallow than we have as an adult, middle-aged, older adult. And we have to recognize no matter where someone's at, that that's what they're dealing with. That's what's frustrating to them. Mm-hmm. And it's tough when it's in your in your own home and your relationship with your family and the dynamics going on between each other and what's happening with one person's affecting the other. And, you know, you're in the middle of dinner and maybe you have a baby and the older two kids are fighting and you can't just, you know, put stop the walk away from the stove leave the baby unattended to go you know talk with the kids but you can foster better communication and um you know starting with simple situations and and building upon it well and and to think about this too is that 
your words coming up, especially negative negative words, can be traumatizing to a small. Even what you think are simple words that you're saying, or a simple thought that you, or a phrase that you put out, maybe seem in, in, not so tough, but can be. Can and I've and I've seen this in adult patients where we when we start kind of delving back into it, their their mom or dad said one phrase to them that led them down a road of belief, you know. Um, and I, right now my, my mind's kind of blank on a, got, a certain phrase. But. I've got a simple example. Yeah. Um, so this person in my child's life, when she was me before, she was put in alpha together herself. And they said, you're going to wear that? What are people going to think of me? And our daughter took it to never wear that particular shirt again. It mm -hmm. was about wearing like plaid with stripes or something. But, you know, and that's something simple and whatever so she you know she just affiliated that shirt with being bad but kids can take things very literally mm -hmm. i used to use the expression well that's not pretty and it, i wasn't talking about about my child it was about something that had happened but i kind of clued in at one point saying okay maybe i need to change that phrase mm -hmm. of what i'm saying because like you said they can take things literally and you know a lot of times we're not we're not intending to be mean when we say things maybe we're joking around throwing a little sarcasm in mm -hmm. there and that's something to really be careful of because I'll be interpreted. young kids and even think about yourself. If you're upset and you're talking to a friend and if they're sarcastic and it's not in the right mm -hmm. time frame, it's upsetting. And and a child is still grasping the language and cognitive skills. And so sarcasm can really well, they, they, throw them off. They and, don't have really good filters. They take things like you say, literally. You know, they they a lot of sometimes don't have support from their family and how to deal with certain things. So they can take something in, and I always say, talk about the fact: wouldn't it be great at five years old if we were able to look back and say, well, you know, I think mom's dealing with a little bit of bipolar, and and maybe it's a maybe. But they can't. They don't have that that development. Yeah. It's not their so, role as a child. No, I know it isn't. And, but and, I'm just and saying that's something we have to make sure we're not putting out onto our children is our own issues and expecting well, them that, to be the parent for us. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, that is. So we we kind of went through this scenario and kind of played out how it typically might play. And again, this is coming right out of the workbook. And when we do these workshops, there are examples of kids of all different ages. Um, so, you know, we've done this workshop with parents of young kids and with 10, 12 year olds, as well as with teens. And we can. Well, in fact, we had one gentleman that was in, um, I think it was one of the last classes we had. He had called me before he signed up for it. And he said, I don't know, this book says it's about kids and children and I have teens. I just don't know if this is going to work for me. And um, in fact, he's actually did a testimonial on it, but. Um, I said, well, you know, I find it even works for adults. So I don't think there's any reason we can't, it wouldn't affect teens also. And he came out afterwards saying, I, I doubted it, but now I've seen, and it has worked with teen because with him in particular, one of the, I was going, one of the things I was going to say in our workshops, one of the neat things that we do is sometimes we will go with something that's happening for somebody right then and there, mm -hmm. an actual scenario, and do the same kind of role play through it. And that's the neat thing about the, the workshop is you have this interaction between parents uh, and, and other parents, and one will say say something, so, oh, well, you know, I've tried this, and maybe that would work, and, and you know, and it was really neat to be able to, for him, we, we played out a teen role, and I, I like I said, it really helped him. So, like I said, this this I really like the first the, the main book, even though they came out with a teens book. This one is just as powerful, and it's just a matter of having to um, you got to be able to change the language as you go into the different years. Well, and you know. this book was written in the eighties, and yeah. the workbook was written maybe in the nineties. I'm not sure, and so even some of the examples can feel a little dated. Billy and Bobby and Janie. <laughs> but, um, you know, we all talk differently depending on where we are in yeah. the country, depending on our age and our background and things. And so 
you know, finding the nuances and how you might say it, that, that yeah. takes a little finesse, but that's where the practice is fun. And, and we keep, we do these by zoom. And so you're online and we've never had more than eight or 10 people together. Sometimes we have a parent without their spouse. Um, I'm trying to think we, you know, we, people who are co-parenting, but not together are certainly welcome on there. Um, we had uh, so somebody that, uh, was very involved with their uh, nephew or niece. I can't remember the name, of, and she wanted to be on. So, and we, she, she came from a background, I think, a teaching background. Uh, but she wanted to be on to to know how to be able to handle her uh, nephew or niece, whatever it was. And then also, like I said, she was using it for adult situations also. And it's great if you know both parents can participate because yeah. then it's you know it's it's really something you're learning together and. Um, it just makes it that much easier to kind of change the vibe in the family and to incorporate some new ways of really listening. And like you said, I mean, it manifests in how they act because if a kid feels heard, you know, when kids are acting out, <laughs> they do really want our attention. And it's, it's not, it's not always a conscious, like, Oh, mom's not listening to me. I think I'll take a crayon and draw on the wall. <laughs> it's kind of like if we react to them when they're doing negative things, well, then that's how they're getting our attention. Yeah. And so it fuels that like, Oh, I got to, you know, if I want mom to, you know, that's the only time I get that attention is if I'm doing something negative. And so it becomes ingrained into them in a way that, um, and we don't realize that. Well, and that, that goes to, true for the parents too we're following patterns of our parents and they're following pattern it, it kind of goes back in in uh deck you know not decade but in generations. generations thank you um but one following the pattern of how they they learn to be parents from their parents who learn from their in, on back and so that one of the things i always try to do in the work i do with parents and we do with parents is try to help them to break that pattern and one of the ways is th is through the communication. Uh, changing your communication can help break some of that pattern that you learned from your parents. And not to beat up the parents of the parents, but to know that again they're they're doing what they know they can do best or, or know how to do best is and learning from their parents. Right, and learning that you know we can always improve how we're doing things. You know, I first read this book years ago. That baby of mine is now twenty six. And I've reread the books over the years. We started doing these workshops. Oh, I think we, we started before COVID. Yeah. So maybe around 2018, 2019 that we started these workshops. And like doing the workshop kind of really helps me tune in to how I'm responding to my kids because each of our kids have different personalities. We've got three. And parenting looks different. We can't parent each child the same. That That's an unrealistic expectation. Mm -hmm. They're born at different times in our lives. Different things are happening. You know, the first child is born into a world of they're the only one versus later children. Well, we've had to actually use the responses while we're doing the workshop when, and being interrupted once or twice during the workshop and having to respond to a child mm -hmm. while we're live on a workshop. And so, you know, we, so so, we, we do these workshops. We limit it to small groups. And then so we're on Zoom. We share the information. Um and then we read through, you know, we kind of involve everybody on doing some of the exercises and then we'll do splitting people up into groups. And, you know, it, it can be helpful to put um, one mom with a different mom mm -hmm. to, to, you know, kind of be in there and getting someone to, especially if someone's having a particular issue, um, like a situation hits home, like, oh, my kid's going through a similar thing. If they get to play the kid in the role yeah, they and can. have the other parent responding as the only, adult. It's been amazing to, to hear them when we come back and talk about how did that feel to you? And and a good majority of the time they'll go, wow, I, you know, now I can really get a better sense of what my, my child was going through. I, I didn't realize it would be that powerful when they actually, even though we, you know, these role plays are kind of, they're a little difficult because we're not a child, but they, they actually kind of get into it and, and really get and the sense not, of it. You know, they're not super intense, you know, yeah. acting skills. But really putting yourself in the situation, taking that hour or two for the class to focus on it versus, oh, when I was a kid, yeah, I remember what it was like. And you're just ranting and going off the top of your head versus kind of really making that effort mm -hmm. um, to do this. So having that that experience and having to, you know, be one-on-one -on -one with another parent and 
being able to practice the skills then on your own with your partner, or if you can, you know, join with a friend, however you want to do it. And then each week we come back, we kind of review, and then we learn into the next skill because there's six different chapters of this book focusing on kind of different areas. So should we uh, re-roll it? We're going to and replay, replay so it and we, with a better way of handling it. So how could we? How could we have responded differently? So we're in the car. We just come back from finish, leaving the circus, and we're quiet in the car. That's, that circus was really dumb. Oh wow! It sounds like you didn't like it. No, I I didn't. It just the animals. The, the animals smelled. Okay, Ugh. so that really bothered you. Is there more? Yeah, I just and and there were so many people around. I just felt crowded in, and and I don't know. It just bothered me, bro. I didn't know we'd be around that many people. Mm, sounds like the amount of people there was overwhelming, and the animals, yeah, have lots of smells. And I know you're really sensitive to yeah, different I, smells. I, I was looking forward to. It. I was uh, kind of excited, and then when we got there. It started to bother me. And then there were other kids around. I didn't want to look stupid in front of them. Sounds you know, disappointing. You thought it was going to look one way when we went, and it looked very different when we got there. Yeah, I don't know if I want to go back to the zoo, to the, to the circus anymore. You didn't really have a good time. No. Yeah. But cotton candy was good. <laughs> I'm <laughs> glad you... And the, oh, and the ice cream. We did have ice cream, too. That was pretty good. So glad, I guess that, that was okay. I'm glad you told me this. I didn't think about all those different factors playing into it. Yeah, you know, I was kind of scared. Mm -hmm. Those animals come out, and I wait for it to kind of jump over and get me or something. Yeah, that's frightening. <laughs> I'm, I'm tearing up. <laughs> <laughs> it's affecting me. <laughs> Mom, why do you do that to me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really got into it. <laughs> ah, so anyway. So the questions. <laughs> what were your feelings as you talk to your I parents? I was feeling very, very sad and kind of a little bit angry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How did you feel about the circus when the conversation was over? I get emotional over these things. <laughs> Can I have the pot? <laughs> You asked for a tissue, yeah. not the entire box. <laughs> I just thought you would pull a tissue. Ah, <laughs> uh, role playing. We have feelings that get bottled up inside of us. Yes. Maybe there's something in my childhood. <laughs> and things get bottled up and they come out in funny ways. I, you know, I've got one kid who holds things in and they, they get angry about things and it's coming out as anger because they're suppressing. They feel mm -hmm. embarrassed. They feel dumb for feeling the way they feel, feeling different than other people. And they bottle it up and it, it can come out as anger. Well, I remember as a, as a kid, just a little story, but um, about not being heard or seen uh, as a child. And when my mom and dad, I don't know, I think I was probably about 10 my mom and dad um, had had an anniversary, their 25th anniversary, and they made a big thing of it. They had a reception and, and band and all that stuff. But my my brothers and my one sister um, decided to go in together and plan a trip for them, like a, a second honeymoon kind of a trip for them. And they're much older than you. Yeah, most, most of them were adults already. My oldest brother is 12 years older than I am, and um, the nearest besides the sister I lost, the nearest is five years from me. So they had jobs, they had money. they And um, they excluded me from the plans. And then the day uh, that they decided to tell mom and dad about it, it was all new to me. I, and it was, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I, it felt so, I felt so uh, mad and upset and frustrated. Left out. Left out, you know, and they, I said, well, we were just, a, you know, they tried to justify all kinds of stuff instead of just listening to me. You know, we thought you, you don't hold secrets very well. And we thought you'd tell them and we didn't want them to tell. Them. We wanted you to be part of it, but blah, 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 you know, just, and I just, I remember I sat out on the front porch and I cried. I was just so upset, you know, and it, it's affected me this day. I'm mad at you brothers. No, um, <laughs> I think I got over. No, but it was a, it was a 
it's something that really bothered me, really affected me for quite a long time. I didn't, I just didn't feel like I was heard or trusted or any of that. And as being the youngest of six yeah. total siblings, would you like to talk more about this? Well, thing? if I could. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll leave that for a therapist. And I have given, I have been to therapy as far as. And not, you know, we make light of that. And yet, you know, things in our life do affect us. And oh, it yeah. does affect how we respond to our kids. And we might think, oh, it's no big deal. I was raised. I turned out okay. You know, my parents said this to me and I'm okay. Yet, that it goes well, when you get in a real difficult situation, when you're in as a teen with other teens and how you're going to respond and react. And do you feel comfortable coming home to talk to your parents when there's an issue going on? Or you feel like they're not going to really listen anyhow, so why bother? Well, yeah, and then it gets buried kind of deep and it it'll come up and you won't even you don't even really recognize it. You'll be doing a up. podcast and role playing the child with <laughs> going to the circus and tears will start flowing. <laughs> So we yeah. want to tell you more about the workshop yes. that we're going to be doing. So this is designed as a two hour, six week, two hour sessions. And we found for many parents, it helps to split it up into one hour increments because it can be hard to set aside a two hour block of time. And so we have done this once again, where we break it up. So like twice a week and what days of the week have we chosen? Uh, well, it's January 9th. <laughs> it's a Tuesday and Thursday. And so from 12 to 1, which is Eastern Standard Time. Um, so for six weeks, that's the amount of time you need to take. The amount of outside homework involved. Double check my time. It's right. very minimal. Um, each week you read a chapter of the book. And the chapters are about 20 pages. And a lot of that is pictures with cartoons and, and things like that on it. And you can also get the book on i almost said tape but audio <laughs> version vcr <laughs> we do have a cd copy of the how to talk so teens will listen book that i put in our car that does have a cd player but you can get it on an audio file so that you can listen to it um, it helps to read the material some people that have come to us have already read the book it helps to kind of read, read through it again and then when we get together, we do the exercises. We give you a simple little assignment of something to try to focus on until the next session. Yeah. And so taking six weeks out of your busy life, two hours. It's an investment that pays off. Once a week. And, you know, these are important communication skills. It's something we talk about, how it's important to listen to people. In businesses, they do communication skills workshops. They incorporate this. And what about in families and interacting yeah. with others you know you might meet your child's going to a therapist or you're going to a therapist but what about the whole family yeah. having an opportunity to work together and just to, to feel heard mm -hmm. um i like to focus on the feelings because each chapter builds on each other and when when in doubt your kid's upset whatever's going on acknowledging their feelings just start there it can make a big difference and we'd love for you to try that We'd love to hear your feedback, your comments, also your frustrations and what challenges, you know, you got a particular situation that you're struggling with. You know, Don and I have worked with families with kids with some special needs, with anxiety issues, different diagnoses, because we dealt with that with our own kids. Um, my background as an occupational therapist is helpful in that. And as always, we encourage you to continue with therapists and other things that you have. But, you know, we'd love to do... Um, you can join us for our upcoming workshop, but we'd also love to set up a workshop for you and a particular group of people that you're part of. Let us know with the power of Zoom. We can come live to you wherever you are. And it's going to help your ROKI, your return on your kid's investment. <laughs> yeah, me. <laughs> and if you want to find out more, you can simply go to focushealthyfamily.com forward slash workshops. So learn about our workshops, catch all our other podcasts. Every Thursday, we drop a new one. Tuesday, we do a shortened Tuesday tips. Tuesday tips for parents where we go through some different tips. You can find blogs and all our information. Again, be looking. Facebook, Instagram, all of that. Be I looking up for these workshops coming up in January or letting us know if you're interested, you if know, if, either for that workshop or a future you one. You want to, right. to do it with. And to reach out and connect with us. And remember... 
how you treat your kids today, or how you speak to your kids today. <laughs> how you speak to your kids today. Shapes their future and, and yours. yours. <laughs> Look at this. We know this one. <laughs> Take care.